morning, everyone. Welcome. Excuse me. Welcome for the eleventh meeting of fiscal year twenty twenty three. I'd like to begin by uh, welcoming everybody and um, calling the meeting to order. Um, if we could be first begin, I'd like to make introductions of the um, of our team. Um, if we could begin by introducing ourselves, uh, Maggie. Hi, Maggie Oldfield member. Uh, Cheryl. Cheryl Tagayas, clerk. Uh, Sean. Sean Fahey, member. And our staff tonight, Tim unfortunately could not be with us, but we have Josh. Josh Lee, assistant town planner. And Julia. Julia Getman, clerk. Great, thank you so much. Um, we can first uh, begin with our administrative items. Um, and that would be um, beginning with the approval of our minutes. Um, we have four sets of minutes this evening to look at. Um, October 13th, October 27th, uh, September 22nd, and September 27th. I don't know if anyone has any comments um, or if everyone has had a chance to look at those. Minutes? Yes, I think Julia um, circulated all of the minutes that I had added edits to. So um, I think the most recent one was yesterday or today. That would have been October 27th. Yes. How about anybody else? Meredith, I, I, I am, uh, I'm good with all of the minutes except for the 27th. Um, the other three I've already looked at and I'm good with. Okay. Um, and Meredith, the only um, edit I would make on October 27th was on the last page under other business where I discussed a possible violation of the open meeting law. It said, she said she had consulted with town council. So I didn't consult with town council one-on-one. -on -one. I attended a workshop that town council gave where he, where he said that all forms of communication and the rest is fine. Okay. Um, is that acceptable to the others to change that language of that line? It is so to me. So the Sorry, uh, Sean. Uh -huh. So the proposal is to strike the word consulted and put in its place attended a workshop with is that Correct. right okay yeah. um yeah i'm fine with that okay did you get that uh, julia the change yeah got it okay. i'm fine with that too all right so uh but that that particular one um Sean was like, would like an opportunity to review, right? So um, is everybody else good with the September 22nd, September 27th and October 13th? I'm good with those. I thought Sean said he had the problem with the 29, 27. Is that what, did you just he say He wanted that? to hold off on that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought he said 10, 27. Sean? Uh, yeah, the meeting minutes I'm referring to is the joint meeting between the select board and the planning board. That's, that's I believe that's the 1027 meeting, isn't it? No. No, it's the September 27th. Ah, uh, then I am mistaken. The, the only one that I uh, haven't um, gone through is the joint meeting. The others I'm okay with. Okay, so it would be a motion to approve October 13th, October 27th, and September 22nd. 
So moved. There's second. second. Yep, second. Great. Can I just right. add as amended tonight for the October 27th? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, then we have roll call for our um, approval. Um, Cheryl? Yes. Maggie? Yes. Sean? Yes. And myself, yes. Thank you. Okay. So the next thing that we have um, our, on our agenda is the discussion um, of our next meeting. And everybody received the doodle poll and the results. Um, it looks like, although we, I was, you know, because of our Thanksgiving meeting not being able to happen, I was hoping that we could um, do something um, towards the end of November, but it looks like that's really difficult for everybody. So I would, um, in looking at the dates, it looked like we had five people on December 6th um, that could attend. And we also had uh, five that could attend, excuse me, four that could attend, including Tim makes five. Um, and then four on either the 13th or the 15th. And I'm good with either one of those, the 13th or the 15th of December. And, and that was based on, I think Maggie might've missed the first one, Maggie, is that correct? I can uh, make no, just, Rich? oh, sorry. sorry. I, I can make, I can make December 6th. I just cannot make the, um, the week after Thanksgiving. Right, right. So, so I thought, I'm sorry, may I? Yeah. Uh, I thought we were trying to schedule two meetings, one for the one that would be around Christmas time as well as the one that right. would be around Thanksgiving. So you're trying to get both of these dates locked in then that you just suggested? That's what I was hoping, um, two okay. dates, um, because otherwise we had the 8th and the 22nd. Um, this would move it up a little bit. And I also thought, um, you know, depending on what happens with the applicant, if he needs to squeeze in another emergency meeting, you know, before January, it gives us a little bit of um, time. Although it looks like that week of Christmas, everybody's out um, and would, would be difficult. So it might be the early January that we would have another meeting. Um, but these were the most popular dates um, given that it's a holiday time. So the fifth or, and then either the 13th or the 15th. And I think Maggie, it was hard for her to make either one of them, but. Um, but at least she would have made the introduction. Did you say the 5th or the 6th? Sorry, the 6th and the 13th or the 15th. Okay. Meredith, can I ask, are, are, you, are, are, what, are you suggesting that we have a meeting on the 6th and then also have a meeting on either the 13th or the 15th? So yes. two weeks in a row? So we can get our, I know it's okay. two weeks in a row, but it, it just, um, it allows us to not meet during the holidays, but get our two meetings in. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think I, I replied on the on the doodle poll. I am, I am definitely available for the 6th. However, the 13th or the 15th, I, I probably will be uh, out of the country. Okay. So that leaves us less of a quorum. Um, why don't for now, let's plan on the 6th and just, you know, confirm again, um, you know, if two people are out, I hate to meet with just three, but we might need to, so. But I would rather have um, four out of the five of us if possible, so. Um, Meredith, right. Sean is the only one who responded that he uh, couldn't attend on the 13th and the 15th. We have yeses from, from all of you, including Rick. That's what I thought, okay. So Maggie, do you want to double check your schedule? Yeah, I can do time? I can do either the 13th or the 15th. Oh, okay. So let's say the 6th and should we say um, the 15th then? The 6th and the 15th? Does that sound good? Yeah, okay. that sounds good to All me. Right. Okay, great. So we'll plan on that. And now on to Josh for our staff update. Great. 
thank you uh, for that. Um, the um, Winter Valley project um, recently submitted plans for uh, an expansion for another uh, 36 unit building. Um, this, uh, the plans will be taken up by the uh, Conservation Commission at their meeting on the 15th. Um, and uh, we anticipate that they will be scheduling a site walk um, for the proposed site um, on the uh, Saturday, the 19th, that morning at 8.30. So if uh, members, if any of you are interested in doing the site walk, um, I would recommend blocking off um, that Saturday morning uh, to do that. And, and we'll have some final times uh, after the CONCOM meeting on the 15th. Great. Uh, also, I just wanted to update you. We got the news today that we've received two new grants uh, from the community compact program. One that gives us um, fifty thousand dollars towards climate action planning and uh, greenhouse gas inventory update, uh, as well as one to uh, some traffic and pedestrian um, crosswalk improvements. Um, so, so those two projects. Um, have received funding and, and will be part of the, the work of the planning department and, and the, the traffic commission and DPW. So, so those are two good uh, pieces of good news. And I believe that is it. We've got a lot of items that we have staff sort of comments on, but that are, those are the two staff update items. Great, Josh. Thank you so much. Um, and now we have an opportunity for citizens speak. Um, if there are um, any residents who would like to speak, anyone from the audience, we would welcome you to raise your hand. And I see Helen Russell. Josh, if you could invite Helen in. She seemed to be. Uh, Helen, you're in. If you could unmute yourself. Um... Welcome, Hi, Helen. Everyone. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Helen Russell, 190 Central Ave. Um, I, I had some comments on the um, Goddard School project. Uh, we sent a letter, a group of neighbors, on October 24th, um, and I we heard from um, Mrs. McGederick, but we didn't hear from the planning board. Um, I was just wondering, uh, I didn't see the minutes listed, but I think there were some action steps in the minutes um, that you guys were going to follow up on. So um, I don't have the details in front of me, but um, I think we just like to make sure that our concerns about the Goddard School are being uh, heard and acknowledged. And um, you know, just next steps on this process. Secondly, I know that tonight uh, the Goddard School is um, proposing um, that you look at a shingle material. Correct. Uh, um, we did uh, take a look at those and the original Hoosick Club had regular uh, cedar shingles. Um, these have an uneven edge and it doesn't seem to be the same look as what the Hoosick Club had. So uh, we are recommending that as neighbors that are looking at it, um, that you consider uh, matching it to what was, you know, part of the Hoosick previously. So that could be a clabbered or a straight edge on the shingles. Um, my third out of four items, and then I promise I won't take up more time. Um, we were looking again at the plans and we understood there to be uh, in the front of the building facing Central Ave, a berm that would um, hide the, the headlights of cars pulling in and parking. Um, given that the building has been raised up, the elevation is quite a bit higher than what we anticipated. It looks like now that the berm is only going to be a foot uh, instead of what we thought from the photos would at least cover, you know, the headlight line of the cars. Um, and we're dis dismayed to see that the plantings, which we heard uh, Sunny promise would be mature plantings, are all going to be immature plantings. 
small trees, eight feet, three inches in uh, diameter, and also uh, grass and um, lavender, which really won't grow to much height. So that means that uh, particularly for us, um, those headlights are going to be blasting right into the three windows that uh, uh, that our house faces directly across the street. So um, we're concerned that what we thought we were getting is not what we're getting. Um, and that brings me to my last item is this is such a large building and it's so much higher than any of us anticipated, at least those of us that aren't professionals reading landscape plans. Um, and that we have uh, written to Sonny and Marion and CC'd you uh, regarding the plantings. And we are just imploring uh, Sonny to consider uh, the importance of being a good neighbor and um, to replace the immature plantings with things that are going to better screen the building. And that also for the, the back neighbors in the back of the school, who's, you know, you're now looking down on the five foot fence from their driveway. Uh, that a higher fencing uh, and more plantings be considered. So four things, just action steps on the letter we sent, the shingle edge, the berm in the front, and the uh, mature plantings. Thank you very much uh, for your time, and uh, thank you for your service. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. <clears throat> and next, I see Tucker Smith uh, with her hand raised. If we can invite Tucker to speak. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, this is Tucker Smith. Uh, I'm a resident at 1632 Canton Avenue. And this is just really a procedural question. I'm aware that um, an update from uh, Northland Development Corp, Walcott Woods, is scheduled on the agenda. Um, is it possible? for you know me to raise my hand and input at that time or do I do it now <laughs> either one Tucker would be fine okay well why don't I wait and maybe Great. I'll learn something new and in response so that was my only question thanks very much thank you Tucker and <clears throat> I'm not seeing any other hands if there's anyone else who would like to speak please raise your hand uh Jennifer Mills has her hand up can we invite Jennifer in to speak? Sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm at 84 Columbine. Um, I'm also calling about the Goddard School. Um, I, I, I've seen a lot of kind of back and forth on um, the the height and what it looks like. And um, I'm I just out of curiosity's sake, if something happened to the Goddard School, what would be the alternate option in that space? Because as far as I could tell, it would probably end up being a, a, a like a, a luxury apartments or something similar. Um, and I just, I kind of wonder if making the Goddard School harder to build is always the best idea and may not be preventing, um, the Goddard School may not be preventing something uh, larger and more disturbing in the neighborhood. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, at this current time, this is what the, the site approval um, has given. If it was a new use, it would have to come back for a, a new site approval um, on that site for anything else to be built. Can I add something to that, Merida? Sure, yeah. An early childhood um, education facility is um, included in what's called the Dover Amendment, uh, which is um, state law that basically says that this type of use can go in at any location regardless of the zoning, but other kinds of uses aren't automatically allowed to go in there. The underlying zoning here is single family, and so any other use would require um, some kind of other action, either at the Zoning Board of Appeals or, or here at the Planning Board. Uh, that's good information to have, thank you. Thank you so much. Any other hands this evening? I am not seeing any. 
um, then we can move on. Um, and this isn't the next item um, for new business is something I wanted to put on because I think um, I have concerns. Um, the current or the former Bank of America building, which we all, I, I think everyone admires in town, it's sort of a gateway um, property. Um, many of the Bank of America um, buildings have been closed down. And what I've asked our town planner, unfortunately, he's not here. I, Josh, I don't know if you have found out any information but um, buildings across the country have been closed down. And just because of the historic nature of this particular building, uh, time is of the essence that we don't let that building fall into disrepair. Um, so I have asked Tim and the planning department and maybe speaking to the select board to be proactive in finding out um, what the plans are for this building. Um, if there's any, um, you know, maintenance that will happen in the interim until the property is either marketed or Bank of America finds an alternative use. Um, but I, I know, you know, throughout, um, throughout the Boston area, many properties have been closed down. And I think that we need to be proactive as a town to identify who is the property manager and um, just ensure that this property is being properly maintained um, if it is not going to be used immediately. So um, I would uh, ask that Tim and Josh, the planning department, reach out to the select board, find out through the assessor's office who are, who if any contacts that we have or through Bank of America. Um, because I, I think just letting this um, sit year after year um, would be just really a disappointment. So um, that I just wanted to put on record that I'm hoping that uh, we can just preserve that building um, and be proactive in doing so. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. Um, to, to that point, um, I, I have been proactive in, in, in reaching out to the um, those who have applied for building permits on that site historically, so we get their contact info and reach out to them. And um, finally, um, was able to get in touch with the uh, Greater Boston Area sort of uh, regional director uh, for Bank of America, a gentleman named Michael Chamberlain. Um, and so he's he's got. Um, He's got his his feelers out and said he would give us an update um, early next week on um, what their intentions with the site are and and who is um, making those decisions as to the the uses uh, or selling of that that site. The assessor's office didn't have any additional contact information beyond the sort of uh, North Carolina headquarters for the bank, um, but but we've checked in with them, um, and so so. Um, but we, we had a response from Michael, so we, we are expecting um, some some material sort of feedback uh, within the next week or so. Josh, that's great. Thank you so much for following up on that. And I think we just need to keep, yeah, keep following up with them. So thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, and then the next is a Walcott Woods update. Tim is not here, but there was an email, um, basically an email exchange with Walcott Woods um, through their special permit uh, they had agreed to put a walking path along Canton Avenue, and um, that has not been done, although many units have been sold and um, built and are now occupied. There are residents living there. Um, work has not begun yet on that walking path, and I know a lot, that was extremely important to many of the neighbors, um, and I would invite Tucker to speak on that. One other thing that she was um, mindful of, and I would like for her to speak on that, um, is that um, there was a promise that they would mow the lawn on the meadow, um, which um, Tucker can talk more about um, and just how that, you know, um, would prevent invasives and a maintaining um, of, that, of that meadow. So um, Tucker, if you would like to um, unmute yourself and, and speak at this time, I would welcome you to do so. Uh, thank you very much, Meredith. Uh, this Again, this is Tucker Smith, uh, 1632 Canton Avenue. Uh, my husband and I are actually contiguous to um, Wolcott Woods um, at the very end of Carberry Lane. So um, I thank you for reaching out and getting some kind of information. I think the reply from Northland was that they intended to work on this path in the winter time. Um, so assuming there's no snow on the ground, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, you know, it's been so long. 
I'm not sure where we are in the, the yearly cycle of, you know, it seemed to me there was at least three years of permitting and discussions, and then the construction began in a phased period. Um, Meredith, you used the word they promised. I'm not sure um, where this stands, but I know there mm -hmm. were conversations between Northland, um, whether it was Jack Dolly or another representative, and the um, Department of Conservation and Recreation, which um, of course, oversees the Blue Hills Reservation. And there is a, a, a field, it's rapidly not a, becoming not a field, um, it, as it's laying, you know, un, untouched all during this process. But it, it, it lies um, at the back, you know, it's the, the behind, uh, you know, Wolcott Woods, you know, on the very far side from Canton Avenue. Um, and it's between the development and Wolcott Path, which is a major, major thoroughfare, you know, pathway in the Blue Hills Reservation. And it seemed to me, I don't honestly know whether it was an item in the special permit, if it was a, 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 a private agreement between Northland and the DCR, but um, I guess that's my, my query. Um, I, I tried to look for a document or a record or something, but I can't find it. Um, and so, Tucker, so are you referring to the back behind the property, not the front meadow? Is that's that correct? correct. Okay. That's correct. It's, it's Which is behind. under DCR under DCR's jurisdiction. I would have to double check. Well, that meadow, that meadow is. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because they are so the the, the it's right. it's part, it's the reser it, it is the reservation, and then the Wolk Woods is in front of it, and I I believe that there is supposed to be a kiosk and parking spaces on the very back side to accommodate um, any members of the public who would like to park back there and access the reservation uh, from that point, in which case, you know, a field would be mown and presumably, you know, a path, you know, a pathway mm -hmm. established. Um, so I'm just just curious, you know, if, <laughs> if, yeah. if too much more time passes, um, you know, there'll be saplings. I mean, growth happens, you know, nature loves a vacuum <laughs> and mm -hmm. soon it will be very difficult to mow or maintain. So I'm just kind of wondering what the, you know, what a next step might be, or if there's documentation as to who's, who's on first or who might be responsible. Well, that parking area is in a special permit. That was, that was certainly required. Um, and I just would have to go back and double check that special permit um, to see okay. what other maintenance um, is actually written into that permit. Cheryl, you might um, have a memory on that as well. <laughs> I wish my memory were um, yeah. photographic, but it's, unfortunately it's not. Um, I, I would think that we're gonna have to go back and check. I guess on the phasing, there was a phasing plan also, and we would need to check. One thing I'd like to mention um, for both the, um, for Tucker uh, Smith and for the two folks who commented on the Central Ave. And one of the things I'd like folks to know is that once we issue the special permits or the site plan approvals, enforcement of those goes to the building department and the building commissioner. So you can also make sure that you reach out to him and that department um, for status updates and for concerns about uh, compliance with the permit. Uh, we don't have any enforcement authority. I mean, we're certainly happy to you know, look into things and if things aren't going according to the plan, you know, bring that back to the developers. But really it's important to, um, to be in touch with the building commissioner. Um, and, and as far as the permit itself and the phasing, I think uh, we can certainly go back and look at uh, what, whether the path and whether, um, and the timing of the path at Canton Ave and the parking spaces and the connection to the Blue Hills path, uh, what phase those were in, in plan to be in. The other thing I wanted to ask Meredith is, do we have a representative um, from Jack Dolly's company here? Um, from we don't. Here okay. No, Tim wasn't gonna be here, so I didn't schedule him this evening. Um, 
have somebody to come, but we could certainly do that. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. That's, that's good to know. And um, I appreciate the board's time. Thank you for your attention to this and thank you. Okay, anyone else? Um, I think that was the last comment on Walcott Woods. Um, so the next item, and anyone would, is free to speak on this as well, if you would like to, is the 193 Central Avenue. Um, one of the things that our board had um, determined that we needed to sign off on was the uh, final approval of the um, exterior, the shingles on 193 Canton Ave. And we had asked for a sample to be provided of what that would look like. Um, I, I have stopped in um, the office to take a look at um, the, uh, the cement shingles. Um, and I have to say, I'm not ready to vote on this. I feel that um, what I saw, I, I really didn't love. And I, I think this is such an important building. Um, you know, I know it's, um, and, and I'm, the developer's happy to speak to this. Um, I think it's, I don't know if it's the style, um, the, it, the materials, I just, um, I was incredibly disappointed for something that is such an important, um, replacing an iconic building in you know, a neighborhood with older shingle homes that we just don't want this to, we want this to fit in and we want this to be the best project possible for the developer. Um, and I think what goes on this building is, is going to sort of certainly dictate the look and the feel um, of, this, of this site. And while we have done a, we have a special permit, um, which we did agree to um, a particular type of shingle, um, I just would like to hear the board's um, feeling on this and um, you know, what alternatives that the board feels that we might, um, or solution that we can help the developer come up with to, to not hold up his project and, and to um, make sure we're keeping on budget, on time, um, not slowing anything down, but, but really providing the best um, aesthetic for the town, which I think um, is one of the things in a, in a site plan approval. Um, aesthetics are something that, that um, can have a detrimental effect if they're not, um, if, if the right materials are not used. So, um, I'd like to hear other board members um, if you have comments as well. And I do see Sonny's hand up, so I would be welcome welcome him to speak. Uh, Meredith, you want Cheryl to go first? Her, her hand. Yeah. Why don't we? Yeah. Um, why don't? No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine to um, hear from Sonny first. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, and Marion also has uh, requested to join and speak. Great. Okay, if we'd like to bring in both Marion and Sunny, we could probably bring both of them in to join us. All right, Sunny, I'm afraid uh, we can't hear you. Uh, still no, I'm afraid. <clears throat> uh, nope. If you go without your headphones, perhaps, or or, or join join via your telephone, uh, I can let you in as a panelist that way. <clears throat> Do 
technical difficulties tonight. <clears throat> While he's trying to take care of that, how about we allow Marion to speak in the meantime? That'd be great. Yeah, Marion, if you'd like to go ahead. All right, I'll fill in a little bit. Um, great. Thank you. Although I'm interested in hearing the comments, I'm, I'm certainly, um, my problem really is, I went back and I even looked at the um, videotapes of the meetings from last year when I saw this was on the agenda. And I also looked at my memo that I sent the board on October 27th, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is a memo in which I explained the reason for the selection of fiber cement shake siding. And, um, you know, that it's more fire resistant, durable, sustainable, paint lasts longer. It's it's more expensive, but it's less, it's easier to maintain um, and it will last. And it's the type of finish that you want on a commercial building like this school that doesn't want to have to spend a lot of extra money on maintenance on a regular basis. Um, so it was very much preferred over cedar shingles. And one of the other reason was that it's fire resistant and cedar shingles are not. Cedar shingles are subject to rot and insects. They need a lot more maintenance. So all of that information was presented to the board well before you voted this decision. Uh, and the board was supportive of the use of fiber cement shake siding, but I also provided pictures of the type of fiber cement shake siding, which was the staggered shingle that you see in the sample that's been provided. And there were no objections to that design and everybody looked at it. I mean, we had pictures, we talked about it at the meeting. We also were asked to provide a sample um, because people you know, wanted on the board wanted to see, well, what does it really look like? We don't know what it looks like. Is it shiny? Is it matte finish? What's the color? And we agreed that we would order a sample and we would bring it to the planning board office and put it in the office. Um, the board was eager to complete their decision, approve the special the site plan approval. So they we, they said, why not just put a condition in the decision that the shingles have to be provided for inspection and that the board will approve them, I guess, in a vote at a meeting. And we provided the shingles within two weeks of that discussion. They have been in the planning board office for a year. And we have never heard any feedback from anybody that they didn't like them or that the color was bad or or anything. And we're well along in the construction process now. I'm sure that will be explained um, by Sonny. Um, but I talked to the construction uh, manager today and or I emailed him and he said, well, they're on order and they're pre-painted so they can't be returned. So we have a real problem now because we assumed... <laughs> With all the discussion last year, the whole point was that we were going to get those shingles into the office and the planning board was going to look at them right away, anyone who was interested. And we, so that we would know. And then, you know, if there was an issue, we would come back to the planning board, we'd discuss it further, you know, and so on and so forth. So now I think this puts the applicant in, a, not the applicant, but the school in a very difficult position. And if they, so I, I mean, I respect your comments that every, you know, but you should have been looking at these months, you know, a year ago. It's actually a whole year since we provided the sample. And at this point, I don't see what can be done. And I and also don't really, I think, I think they will be attractive. I think the effort was being made to make them look more like shingles, which was the original Hoosick building finish. Um, and so that's my speech. But I did want you to know that I went back and very carefully looked at what the board said. I watched the videotape. I read the memorandum. I've read the opinion, the decision, of course, that has a condition in it. And because we never heard anything, we thought everything was all set. I mean, it, it was the type of situation where you expected to get feedback right away if somebody didn't like it, or at least within a month or two. Thank you. Well, Marion, I can just say I am so incredibly disappointed because I asked him, I said, you know, this is, you know, something that we were supposed to approve and I could see construction moving along and I was surprised that you hadn't provided anything or your team hadn't provided anything and I asked him and he said oh they've been here for a while I had no idea Marion until right now that you've had those materials for a year which we is said really we would put them in the happened. office right away and we did so we did what we That's, were asked to do thank you I I'm sorry um 
and I think we can have a talk with Tim on why, you know, you went ahead and ordered it, not knowing we had signed off on it, unfortunately, as well. So it was certainly a miscommunication. Mm -hmm. um, and is it prepaid? Has it, um, it, would there be an opportunity for it to be rather than the uneven shingles have something that would be more um, consistent with what we see in the neighborhood? Is that something that um, Sunny could, I don't know, the architect could find out? It, well, Sunny it should answer that. But my understanding is the shingles have been ordered. So, you know, I, but I'm not the contractor. So do you know, Sunny? We still can't hear you. Uh, Sunny, you're still muted. I assumed you were the phone number. Um, and if you are, you can unmute that phone. You're not. You're not unmuted on the on the phone. I, I can only ask you to unmute. I can't unmute you. I'm afraid. Okay. Is is that better? Can you guys? That's it. Me? That's it, Sunny. Thanks. Okay, that did it. All right. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, and uh, maybe what I'll add is. Um, I I never I guess I don't recall and I, I guess I appreciate uh, you know Marion going back and checking the video. My memory was that the discussion was around the style of the shingle rather than the fiber cement. I think we had had that discussion previously that right. the fiber cement would be more durable, fire resistant, and in light of the previous building catching fire, the appropriate material selection for the building. I think the sample was more to confirm it's not going to be shiny. Uh, it was matte finish. So that was my recollection. And uh, you know, since Marion has confirmed listening to the video, it was more around the style. Uh, right. Unfortunately, I, I have already talked to the, build, uh, the general contractor. They are supposed to start installing this next week. Uh, the material was ordered, I don't know how many months ago, but uh, my understanding is there is no way we can go back and change the style or the color. Uh, in spirit of you know being collaborative, I will certainly ask him. I'm going to be seeing him tomorrow to see if there's any way we can do that without incurring additional cost. Uh, and if so, by all means, you know I'll be happy to accommodate. But if it's not an option, uh, I would unfortunately say that's not something we would be able to accommodate in light of, you know, as Marion said, the samples were provided a year ago. And um, it is confirming from the architects, uh, I guess, design who's an expert in this, he's assured us it looks very much similar to the previous building. Yes, it's a different material, but it's a more durable material. I know it's difficult because the shingles are not up, so not everybody can visualize, but he's an expert in design and in material. So he's assured me this is as close to the original building with the exception of the material. It's a fiber cement because it's fire resistant, more durable, lasts longer. Uh, but like I said, in the, in the spirit of collaboration, I will certainly bring this up tomorrow and come back uh, with the findings. But my understanding was it was prepaid uh, and also keeping in mind everything because of the cost, uh, you know, I guess with inflation, with everything, uh, there was, uh, I guess, not only supply chain issues, but cost issues. So a lot of these things were ordered months ago. Uh, so it will be mm -hmm. not only cost prohibitive, it will stall the project for months, which obviously no business would like to do. Thank you, Sunny, so much. Yeah, that is, we certainly do not want to stall this project or cause any further, you know, any expense. Um, but what I would ask is if you could find out tomorrow, if they could at least do a straight line shingle, which would be more consistent with what you see throughout Milton, um, if, that is, um, if that is something. And also, are there any examples of local projects that have, the, the, have used this shingle that, um, that we could go see? Yes, I believe so. In fact, the architect had shared the details last year. I'll have to go back and talk to him, but I know he confirmed there are actually buildings in Milton which have the staggered edge, uh, which have been used. So I'll have to go back and talk to him and I'll come back. That would be great. I'll follow up with Tim tomorrow um, and he can maybe talk, to, we can talk tomorrow. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate this. Um, there's a gentleman. Yes, yeah, sorry, Sean. Could I? Could I? Uh, have we lost Sonny? No, he's here. No, I'm here. I was. If I can make a suggestion, Meredith, which might might simplify um, this particular issue, uh, I, I've, it's often hard for anyone to see a single shingle and get comfortable with what it's going to look like on a building. And and I do agree that uh, seeing a seeing it installed would be helpful. I'm confident that the builder might be able to do this on the site. And if he did something as simple as uh, prepare a sample four feet by eight feet, he could use a one sheet of plywood and, uh, it, and, um, and put together um, a sample on a four by eight sheet of plywood so that everybody might have a chance to get a little bit more comfortable with what that particular shingle will look like when it's laid up on a wall. Um, I was going to suggest that same thing, Sean, that we'd sort of ask for like a wall sample, like a sample um, of what the, what it would look like um, together. So it sounds that like probably, can, yeah. that, that probably can be done very quickly. Um, and even if it's not the same uh, color that that Sonny's building will be, it, it'll give everybody a, a good understanding of what that um, shingle will look like when it's on the building. It's certainly a much better understanding than looking at a shingle um, that's mm -hmm. not installed and not. Uh, yeah. And anyhow. Uh, Sean, Tim shared out some images earlier this week um, that um, we, we have installed this in other places in Milton and particularly um, 50 Elliott Street. Um, he and I went down. Um, took a couple of photos. Um, so this is what it looks like in yellow, obviously, um, at, at um, 50 Elliott Street, and then um, in, in a sort of greeny uh, olive gray um, at, at a different building as part of that, that development. So this is what it looks like um, in, in situ. It has that sort of naturalistic uh, look um, that's a little more clearly um, understood than just uh, two pieces in the planning board office. Um, there's, Thanks, there's buildings in Melton that have used this material. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so we'll follow up tomorrow with some questions, but I, I think somebody else from the... Um, I did have my hand up too. They still would like oh, sure. to come back to me, but I'm fine to hear from sure. Melon first too. That's great. Hi. Um, I, I really, maybe I need a little clarification on the process, but I don't understand, Sonny, why you would authorize the purchase, such a big purchase, when it was clear there needed to be an approval. And I understand that you dropped the sample off a year ago, but the, the fact that you would go ahead and make that purchase, knowing that it was supposed to be approved by the planning committee, and then come back to us and say, I can't do anything about it. It's your fault. You never looked at the stuff. You know, it it's it it's it's so arrogant. And uh, I feel that way. It's uh, disappointing to even hear these comments. Uh, it, I'm I'm not sure what you were expecting from us because we dropped the samples a year ago. I'm I'm not sure where the arrogance comes in. Uh, it's really disappointing that you would say something like this and even feel that uh, if if anything else, you know, I guess any sympathy or empathy that I'm expecting from our neighbors has evaporated after the fire. It seemed like everybody was very supportive initially, but as the project has gone along, sympathy is far along. It's, if you step into our shoes, we are two years behind the project uh, and several hundred thousand over budget uh, because of inflation because of supply chain issues. Uh, even your comments about, uh, you know, uh, and I mentioned this to Marion, you know, the request from the neighbors about being considered about plantation, about fences. And I told Marion, I said, we'll do everything we can to be good neighbors. I've said that all along, but you know, it, it works both ways. If the neighbors are supportive of us, we will do everything we can. 
but as long as it's cost neutral, because at some point, you know, the decisions are financial. So I'm sorry, this is not me being arrogant. It's just me being practical. You know, we followed the process. We did what we said we would do. We provided the samples a year ago. And in light of not hearing back, the assumption was there are no issues. If there were issues which were pointed out, we would have gone long along before, changed the design, come back with other proposals. Now we are a week before installation. Like I said, I will still look into it tomorrow, but that's not me being arrogant. That's just me being you know, factual. In fact, I didn't know until Marion sent an email out yesterday that this was going to be discussed. Uh, it's basically out of left field for us that this was even something which was open. Uh, it was very surprising. So it's not like we went and you know behind the planning board's back and said, oh, we're gonna order this regardless of what they think or feel. That's not what, what happened here. You know, We had a discussion, we provided the samples within two weeks. Uh, there were pictures which Marion provided. There were pictures we just saw, uh, which were you know shared with the group. So those have been all uh, present all along. That's nothing new. We are not just trying to pull a fast one. If anything, you know, we are still trying to say, okay, we'll try to see what we can do. Uh, that's the opposite of being arrogant. That's being uh, a good neighbor. That's being, you know, collaborative. That's what I would say. Well, I, I will just say, according to the permit, we still have the right to, to turn this material down. And so it's unfortunate that there was miscommunication. Um, I don't see our board doing that, but if we could, if you Meredith, could just check in. Yes. Sorry. Um, I don't think we have an opportunity to turn the material down. We approve fiber cement siding on this building. Correct. Um, what we asked for, and this is one of the things that I think it's a good lesson for writing decisions because we see that these projects like Wolcott Woods, like this one, may take years um, to come to fruition and there will be changeovers in board and staff over that time. And our documentation needs to outlast all of those changes and needs to be something that's readily enforceable. And, you know, our, like I said before, the building commissioner is responsible for enforcing the permits. And so at what point would he normally think to look to the planning board? You know, he's not involved in when materials are ordered. When they issue the building permit, it's based on the set of plans. And then they go out in the field and they see that the project's being built according to the plans. So it's one of those things where it's like, how do you, how do you capture the enforcement piece on this? So I, I don't want to, I don't think it's right to point fingers at people. Um, the applicant, the planning director. Um, I think it's all of us trying to think about how these things can be enforced and how we can get the best project. I mean, Mr. Verma is bringing an asset to the community. You know, um, everyone was happy when it looked as if they could save the existing building and, um, and have it not be torn down for some other use. And so um, there is fatigue over time, and I get that too. I'm in the business, and you know, being an architect and working on projects and taking years for them to, to come to fruition. Um, and I do think that Mr. Verma is trying to be accommodating uh, with things that are coming out of the ground and the way things are, are looking, and it's being a surprise to people. We've heard that from neighbors, and I appreciate that. And if he, um, can continue to uh, can maintain that spirit of being the good neighbor and working on the things that he can work on. I think uh, I, I, um, I'm very thankful for that. Um, and as far as uh, Sean's suggestion, um, a mock-up is a great idea. And if we, if he can get that mock-up, you can get your contractor to do that mock-up even on the building itself. Um, and if we can schedule a special meeting just on site to look at that mock-up so that we don't have to wait two weeks, then I think that would be in the spirit of cooperation on our side. And, uh, and maybe even neighbors are invited to the property to take a look at it as well. So, um, so that's my suggestion. Sunny, would that be possible to do that? 
or can you find out tomorrow if that's possible? And then we can follow up with the board. Uh, you're muted, you. Sonny, sorry. I'm sorry, I was gonna say, uh, there already is on the site, a shingle on the plywood, which uh, the, I guess, contractor port up along with the stone. So you can view that tomorrow if you guys, if you guys would like, we don't have to wait a few weeks. I guess the main question which I'll ask him tomorrow is whether it can be exchanged without incurring a penalty or a cost. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be the key for us. And you know, like I said, I'll check on that tomorrow and report back um, and, and hope that the planning board and the neighbors would work with us as well. As I mentioned, the project is significantly over budget and almost two years behind. You know, please step in our shoes. Uh, we are not, um, I guess, <laughs> financially, uh, I would say we are stretched extremely thin to incur any more cost. It's just, it's not something we can sustain. So I'm not saying that out of arrogance, I'm saying that out of reality. You know, if you imagine a project is two years behind and you know, you're doing everything you can to open up, uh, that's the reality. That being said, I will certainly investigate that tomorrow with the builder. And as long as we can swap this out for another fiber cement without incurring a cost, by all means, we will do that, assuming we will not have a delay. So if he's telling me this will not be available for three months, Obviously, we would not want to do that and shut our project down through the winter. Uh, nobody would want to do that. So, but I guess I don't want to assume the first. I'll report back tomorrow what I find. Thank you, Sunny. I really do appreciate that. Is there anything else from anyone from the board? Yeah. Meredith, yeah, can I say something? Yeah. Um, so, Sunny, I totally appreciate your position. I have been in, in your shoes just a few short years ago as I went through the special permit process for my business. Um, it was, it's a painful process and it's a very expensive process. And I, I had to even move a fence a mere six inches from when we installed it with a rubber matting on it because the building inspector said it was placed at a wrong um, um, setback. Um, I do think that there's a lot of miscommunication within the halls of town hall. And that was really, really frustrating to me, especially when the building department is right across the hall from the planning department. And you kind of would think that there was more communication that happened, that happens, but it really doesn't happen that way. So I, I really feel your pain. Um, but I also feel the neighbor's pain a little bit because they bought their houses with knowing that the old Who's It Club was there and it had a certain look. And you know, most people are not in um, the profession of building and architecture. So seeing something on a plan is totally different than when you see the framing go up. And, and I totally understand when grades change and buildings have to be built um, slightly elevated because the grade changed. Um, so it's, it is a big change. And and when I went back to read the, the special permit, it said in quotes, the fiber cement shingles to be used on the new building shall be approved by the planning board. So I think everybody understands the benefit of fiber cement. Um, my husband is a contractor and I asked him and he said, the brand you picked is really top of the line brand. So you are going above and beyond he said Hardy Board's been, you know, a premier um, distributor and they've worked through the kinks. Um, so it's a, it's a great product. Um, and because it's a great product, it does last 50 years um, with very minimal maintenance. 
And I guess that's sort of where I'm kind of hung up on when I went to town hall to go look at it. And again, I've only been on the board since April. And this is the first time just recently that I was told to go look and check out a sample. So I do apologize for that miscommunication. But I was really disappointed like Meredith when I went in. Um, and I'm not so hung up on the color. Um, you know, I don't think that we really should be dictating colors. Um, but I, I was a little bit um, unsettled to see the jaggered edge. And I, and I looked in, in research and looked into the, all the pictures and all the um, pictures I found with the siding with the jaggered edge, it really was more of a cottage style um, design that this jagged edge is, is used on, or it's used on where like the dormer, like Josh showed, it was just like at the dormer at the top. And so your building is an attractive building, but it's also a big building. And I think for me, and I'm a very visual person, for me to see, to visualize this whole building with the jagged edge, you know, I, um, it just looks unfinished or it looks like the contractor put it up, um, you know, well, after a night of being out drinking too much, it just is not, a clean classic, a straight edge is a clean classic look. And I'm just afraid this jagged edge on such a big area um, is going to sort of stick out a little bit. So I, I honestly feel your pain and I'm not really sure where we stand, but as I was told going through my process, you know, words matter and you do have to stick to what the agreement was and what the special permit says and the special permit says, you know, it shall be approved by the planning board. And, I, and I'm just having a hard time really knowing and agreeing to this look that's gonna be there for a very long time. And I'm, I'm really struggling with this decision. So uh, I'm sorry to be so long-winded. Maggie, just just quickly as a, as a point of clarification, um, uh, because just as you say, uh, it's very clear that we're 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 clear with the words. This is this is not a special permit process. This is the site plan approval, okay. um, which which does have a very distinct, different sort of um, what the bylaw bylaws say is is within the purview of the planning board. This this was in an email uh, Tim sent this this morning again that. Um, there, there is no design review function in our bylaws for um, site plan approval. Um, you know, we the bylaw does not give the board the ability to require these these materials. The, the purpose of the the sample and this approval was to uh, confirm that what was approved previously by the board was the material that was um, purchased and used. Um, it's so that uh, Sonny didn't say we're going to be using fiber cement uh, board and then came back and said, here's the bricks we're using. Um, so, so that was um, the intention that, that Tim um, clarified. Right. We, were to, we, were, we, were, we, we were supposed to sign off on the final decision of the, of the design. Can I add another comment? Because I have, since I was on the board when this was first submitted and approved, I do have plans and I can do a screen share. The building elevations show this particular sta staggered uh, line. It, and so that's what we approved. And I'll share my screen and you can you all can take a look because we, all, we are not being asked to amend uh, a permit. Um, we're being asked to approve a sample, which um, is, is supposed to be consistent with what we approve. And you can see in the siding right here that what they've submitted as a sample is consistent with the drawings that are the basis of our approval. I'll stop my share. Thank you. So I think where we are this evening is we can follow up um, tomorrow evening, um, I mean, tomorrow with, um, with Tim and with Sunny to find out what you can find out, Sunny, if, if that's even an option. And if we can see it on the building, a mock-up. 
Sure. Just real quick, uh, I'll be honest, uh, uh, this is just my view. When we first picked the staggered edge, I was not uh, the, I guess, craziest about it myself or a fan, but I thought that's what everybody wanted. Uh, and as we just heard from Cheryl and you saw in the drawings, we used that because that was the basis that the architect came up with in trying to capture the look of Jose Club. Original. The original Jose Club, it had similar staggered, okay. yes, it was cedar, uh, you know, shingles, I guess not fiber cement. If it was up to me, I would have actually gone with something straight. But we went in the spirit of trying to replicate, yes, obviously it's not the building which burned down, but it was more a tribute, yeah. you know, to the building. That's why you see the arch windows. A lot of the, even the stone was designed to look like the old club. So, you know, I can understand where some of your feelings and emotions are coming from in terms of maybe is it the best look? It was more us trying to pay tribute to what we lost rather than being at our first choice. That being said, you know, I will discuss with the GC tomorrow if we can do anything about it. But, uh, you know, it's been illustrated in the drawing all along, along with a sample as to what it would look like. So thank you, Cheryl, for sharing that with the, with the team. And like I said, I will again go back in the spirit of being a good neighbor and see what we can do without incurring additional costs or delays and report back. That would be great. Thank you, Sunny, and thank you, Marion. Thanks. We'll talk tomorrow. Okay. Okay, so moving on um, now to old business. Um, we now have the discussion um, and vote on committee appointments to the Master Plan Implementation Committee. Um, the three uh, candidates that we have um, that are before us right now for the one spot available is um, we have the applicant of Warren Lizio, uh, Demetrius or Jim Davis, and Jonathan Lashley. Um, and Cheryl, do you wanna speak from the master plan implementations uh, recommendation first and then open it to the board? Sure. Uh, the committee um, agreed that all three candidates uh, were uh, highly qualified and each met the um, the qualifications that were set out in, in the um, original approval of the formation of the committee. Um, however, one had to be recommended. And so um, after some discussion, short discussion, uh, Warren Lizio was, um, was recommended. And I understand that the select board um, took a vote and uh, to appoint uh, Mr. Lizio. Um, after, sometime after our uh, last MPIC meeting on this. That is correct. Um, any other comments from other board members? Meredith, well, I, this, is, this is Sean, I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble seeing because I'm on two screens, so apologies. That's okay. Um, I, I assume our, our process is to nominate a person tonight is is that right correct okay um I, I you know based on um my review of warren lizio's uh credentials i i feel he's a i feel he's a very good candidate so um I, i'd be prepared uh to uh to move forward to a um to a vote i i, I honestly don't know that I need a lot of discussion on that, nor do I do, nor do I need, um, you know, an, an endorsement from any of the members of the board. I'm, I'm comfortable with Warren if we're, if we're uh, able to move forward to a vote. Okay. Is there a second? Yes, yeah, second. Any further discussion? Then I would, I would um, ask for a roll call. I think um, I think they're all really. We're very fortunate to have such a well qualified applicant. So I just I want to again thank everybody who put their name in. Um, but I would support this nomination. Um, and so we can do a roll call then. Um, Cheryl. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. Jim. 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 Yes. J
Yes. Sean. Yes. Maggie. Yes. And myself. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, next on our agenda is the discussion of the MBTA community's multifamily zoning law. Um, is there anybody here from the public also who would like to speak to this? Um, let me just see. They would like to come and speak. Um, unfortunately, Tim is not here. Um, and although I, I would like for people to know that we do have on our website now, um, all the materials and Josh, I don't know if you would like to speak to this on yeah. what is available for the public. Cause I think that's also helpful for yeah. those watching to hear. I, I would uh, love to share. I'll quickly pull it up so people know what it looks like. Um, so uh, I developed uh, a quick uh, landing page. Uh, if you can all see our screen, um, it's accessible as, as a sort of persistent link on, on the, the planning department webpage. Um, it, it provides um, information about what the MBTA community's uh, requirement is, um, what the, the new zones have to look like, as well as important um, links to um, Mass Housing Partnership, which has done a lot, uh, particularly with regards to um, webinars and, and visual trainings uh, that have been highly useful for staff, but also for folks looking to understand more, as well as the documents we've prepared. Um, the uh, briefing that Tim gave to the select board, uh, or that rather the DHCD did, as well as the presentation Tim prepared for the planning board um, on October 13th. So those are all accessible and will be updated regularly um, as we move forward. Um, I, I think um, Tim, Tim was uh, particularly interested in, in the board discussing um, it's uh, priorities for discussion and to priorities for the agenda with the, the elected officials uh, delegation um, to, to really hammer in what um, you guys want to talk about with them and, and have a very clear agenda um, on that front. Um, Is that it, Josh? Sorry. Uh, yeah, Were that's, you okay, I didn't that's know the you webpage. Said something else. Okay. Sorry, I, I, I end sentences with um, it's very, it's not a very good. <laughs> that's, a, that's okay, thank you, you're doing great. Um, so I, if there's any comments from the board, um, but, but I feel like maybe Tim should be here when we talk about moving forward and next steps, um, but I'm open to what the board would like to do on this. If you'd like to talk about this also, tonight, or Tim is perfectly comfortable with me being here and, and passing along what your your comments are, um, so that he can move forward with it, you know, during during the, the day. Um, so great, thank you. Yeah, I thought from his email, Meredith, that he wanted us to discuss what scope of work we might want from a consultant. Um, right. And I went to the um, MPTA section of the Mass.gov website, and I followed and look through some of the materials there as well as followed some links to the Mass Housing Partnership and look through uh, some information there. And um, if you guys haven't had a chance to do that yet, I would suggest it because there's a lot, there's a lot of information there and it's hard to actually go through it all. Um, one of the questions that I, uh, I took some, uh, some notes on one piece of it and I did wanna just at least share a little bit because I'm, uh, hopefully you can take a look yourself. There's a, uh, a webinar that's on the um, bottom or towards the bottom of the page, the mass.gov or MBTA communities page. It's from September 8th of this year um, that the state put together as a kind of an update. And the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development um, person, Michael Keneally, um, did one part of the presentation and I wanted to draw your attention to it. There's I think it's about just under nine minutes in, maybe at the 8.45 mark. Um, he mentions that uh, a lot of communities have been asking about whether um, the only penalty for non-compliance is the lack of grant funding. 
And he said that that should not be assumed to be the only penalty, that the word shall is in the uh, statute and that their view is that it's a mandate. So just, I think it's worth taking a look at that to see what, you know, see what you see from that. I know Tim has mentioned that, but that's come up in questions in our discussions. And then the other thing that was interesting was this compliance model that Tim mentioned that they're working on. They talk about what that is and how that's going to work. I know one of the questions at our last meeting that came up was, uh, how does it, how does that model work and how does zoning work with already existing development? So like 88 Wharf, for example, or Milton Hill House. And what that was explained in that webinar is that it's based on unit capacity. So you don't count the existing units, but the, the land that those units are on is, is, is what you're counting and the capacity that's built into that. So it could be more or less than what that existing building development is already there. And so we can include any part, any of those in it. Cause I, I know that was a question we had before from, yeah. but from listening to that webinar is pretty clear that we can include those properties that are already fully developed. Um, and so then um, the, the other thing uh, that it mentioned is the compliance model is not as rigorous as a built, that tool is not gonna be as rigorous as a build out analysis which I think is another important thing for us to understand because in terms of thinking of scope of work for a consultant, he said that it's really going to be um, like an Excel spreadsheet that is informed by GIS information. And so that's not something that's easy for people to visualize density, which is you know, something we've talked about before. So based, on that, I looked at what the grant that Mass Housing Partnership has in terms of scope. Their maximum awards are up to $25,000 per project. Their priorities are the rapid transit communities. And that would, we would fall into that. And they have, uh, they're going to, the round one grants will be awarded up to two, up to 20 communities. So the scope of work, that they allow for those, which I think is useful for us, whether we get this grant or not, you know, whether we're thinking about using other monies for it, is um, the scope is identifying district boundaries, developing and or evaluating proposed use and intensity requirements, estimating unit capacity and gross density using DHCD's compliance model and drafting zoning amendments. So, the compliance model, I think, can get us a certain distance. I don't think it gets us to the level that we've talked about. And so it, for grant money, I think we'd want to be looking at more of a, a visual build-out analysis that could accompany the GIS and the Excel kind of spreadsheets and tables and analysis. So something like I, I think I mentioned before is what could it look like on a five acre site at 15 units? Is it townhouses? Is it garden apartments? Is it, you know, mid rise? You know, just what is it? Because, you know, and it could be any one of those depending upon the setbacks, the lot coverage and, and you know, the dimensional requirements. So I think it would be useful to understand because, you know, density, um, there's not only one solution to it, you know, to those um, density numbers. So I think that's key. Um, community engagement is key and having someone who can really um, help design a community engagement plan. When we did the master plan in 2013 and 14, the consultant that the planning board hired was hired because of their community engagement plan that they prepared. Um, you know, and, and, and I participated in those interviews um, with the planning firms and it was, uh, you know, there was a difference in that in that component of it. So the experience, you know, all these other things that could be equal, the community engagement piece, I think was really important. And so um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that the Mass Housing Partnership has a link also to a study that was a um, fiscal impact study that was done for the town of Westford 
It was the impact of multifamily housing on municipal services and schools. And so, um, Sean, I think that's something that you had asked about. It was done by a, a firm named RKG Associates. And if you're interested, I can send that over to Josh and he can distribute it. So there's some inter interesting information there. But, it, you know, they, it does talk about um, how this kind of work could be done. And so I think uh, that's another piece that we've talked about doing. And there was one last thing that I wanted to mention. Um, there's a lot of mapping tools actually, which are kind of interesting. Um, this isn't a map, but it's a printout from the mapping tool. I had asked about what's the density already, you know, um, in the areas, in the catchment areas along the trolley stops. And that provides this, this is called the TODEX MA Transit Oriented Development Explore. It's on the Mass Housing Partnerships website also. They've got links to like five of these different tools, lots of different, lots of good information. But in any case, it shows the, uh, the catchment area, how many acres, um, and you can select this by bot and by Milton, you know, and specific to the Milton station. So it tells you what the acreage is near that station, what the residential unit count is and what the density on a units per acre basis. And Capen, so the lowest density per acre is the is near the Capen Street station and that's four units per acre. And then in, on the Milton side, the highest is the Milton station, which is seven units per acre. So I think it, we, you know, can help us begin to think about, you know, uh, 15 units per acre, um, what we are currently and what that might mean at 15. So maybe even some of our consultant services helps us take us through these databases that are existing and helps put together presentations for us. You know, so that it helped there, because like, like I said, there's a lot of information there and there's a lot I think that we can learn from and the public can learn from, from kind of spending the time applying the things that are important to us. That's great, Cheryl. Um, did anybody else have anything that they would like to add this evening? Uh, Sean's hand is up. Sean, please go ahead. Th thanks, Josh. Thanks, Meredith. Um, I, I would be uh, interested, Cheryl, thank you, in seeing that financial analysis um, that you referenced in regard to the town of Westford. So if you, would, uh, if you wouldn't mind, that'd be great if you could send that along to Josh. Um, I, I, have, uh, I have said in the past, my concern is for um, uh, an analysis of the cost impact to the town. For what this would mean to the town, and uh, I, I'm I am an enormously concerned with what that cost impact would be. Um, and I, I've said in the past, I I that I I'm not saying it to sensationalize this particular topic, but I do think um, if we adopted the zoning and and this actually occurred, and we increased 20 our residential youth, residential units by 25 percent. It would be as impactful, or maybe more impactful, than the Southeast Expressway dividing the town in half. And I don't say that, as I said a moment ago, to sensationalize this. I think it is that dramatic, um, because thus far we haven't been able to. Um, uh, prepare any financial impact to the town. Um, you know, I have tried to utilize just some basic information that we have and, um, and using our, you know, current fiscal year and trying to do some calculations of uh, our existing number of residences, um, cost to departments, just using simple calculations of taking our current budgets, divide them by existing number of residences and extrapolating um, what the cost might be per residence, uh, per uh, service department, 
police, fire, school, public works, the number is staggering. And even when you consider that we would create an, a, a property tax revenue stream, um, the costs for the departments are going to enormously outweigh any, any revenue stream. What could make it even worse is capital cost that we would incur to construct new schools, probably additional space for fire, probably additional space for police. Um, the capital cost for those components would only make this financially even more difficult for the town to absorb. Um, some basic and simple math that uh, uh, from calculations that I have suggests that the cost to the town could be in the neighborhood of $22 million a year in additional service cost. And that is not even considering capital cost for uh, buildings or town infrastructure that we would have to uh, build. I honestly feel that um, the fiscal and financial future of the town really is uh, much more in the hands of our board of select persons and also the town administrator and also the Warren committee. Um, and although we will stay focused on this issue as a planning board, I think uh, I would like Josh and Tim to engage the select board and the town administrator uh, and uh, engage the Warren committee uh, in an effort to analyze financially what the impact would be to the town. Um, I am less concerned with a planning effort. Uh, I'm much more concerned with a financial analysis effort. Um, if this were to be developed as zoning and, and we uh, accept that zoning, we have to do it with the recognition that this could happen. Um, I was a little concerned in our last meeting that Tim made an inference that this might not ever happen. I don't think it's a good approach to zoning to suggest that it might not happen. If we create the zoning, we better expect that it will happen. That, in my opinion, would be the most responsible approach we could take. So I think there's a huge need for the town, and we owe this to our residents. Uh, all of the residents in the town um, to examine what the cost impact would be uh, because every resident in town bears the cost of what it costs to run the town. It won't just be the people that are affected in the neighborhoods. Um, they'll have a different type of impact, but all residents in the town will bear the burden of whatever cost um, this, this type of a change to the town uh, would be. My second concern, and, and uh, it's, it really matters to the people that are in the neighborhoods that would be affected. And we, we do know that uh, what was referred to as the Elliott Street corridor um, in the example that Tim had presented, uh, those people will absolutely be affected by this. And I feel it's our responsibility to engage those residents, to make sure they're fully informed and to give them an opportunity and listen to how they feel about this particular zoning that would probably forever change the area that they chose to live in. So a complete, full and thorough engagement with those residents, um, certainly in that neighborhood and really all the residents in town so that we conduct ourselves uh, very responsibly as a board. And I know that all the members of the board uh, and our staff um, will want to do that. Thank you, Sean. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Um, great, excellent comments, uh, both Cheryl and Sean. Uh, Maggie, is there anything that you would like to add this evening? Um, Yes, yeah, so I know on our agenda we had um, two items about this. Yes. One was 
the priorities for meeting um, or inviting the or elected, elected representatives. So my main question is, is about their understanding of this mandate. Um, and, you know, I want to know what data they reviewed before they voted to support this mandate. Um, and I'm wondering if they could share that information with us, you know, and what their understanding of the repercussions of, of if we chose to accept this, what, what we as a town um, would, um, what the cost to us as a town would be, just as Sean mentioned, but also, I want to know what they thought the repercussions were if we chose not to adopt this zoning. Um, I kind of want to know from them, like what they're hearing from their fellow colleagues, um, what towns are like Milton that, um, you know, have a trolley that's in a, it really is in an extension to a rapid transit, we really cannot be defined as rapid transit. Our trolley is a historic trolley, which is an extension to rapid transit. So I kind of wanted to know their um, opinion uh, in what other towns are like us. Um, I kind of was wondering where they thought they were gonna find the land. Um, to, you know, to fulfill this mandate, you know, both of them do live in, our, two of our three representatives live in Milton. I think one of our state reps, um, I don't think she lives in Milton, but she should be invited and explain to us um, where they think that we're going to find this land. Um, and, um, and I'm, my question is, why does the commuter rail require fewer housing um, or less housing than our uh, our little trolley? Um, so that was my questions. And I don't know, Josh, if you wrote them down and you can pass them along to Tim, but those are my questions that I would like um, our re all three representatives to come and kind of um, explain why they think this is good for Milton. Um, and then, you know, part two of, that's on the, our agenda, which is um, the priorities, I mean, the um, scope of work. So I too am, am focused more like Sean on the, um, on the, the budget. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, I really am a visual person. And so I did reach out to Alan Bishop um, and ask him if he could do a, map for us showing us the half a mile from each of our four stops. So I, I know if, um, he provided it and I forwarded it to Josh and I don't know if Josh you could put that up on the screen but our trolley the length of the line is two miles and then to come out a half a mile it's, it's really very impactful and I want our residents to know really the area in which we're talking about. And there are 1800 housing units in this area that is in the dotted line. And in and within that, all those 1800 units include single family houses, two families, three families, and you know, 88 Wharf and Milton Hill and Hendry. So it's a, a variety of mixing of mixed um, types of housing, it's a diverse housing mix, but currently there's 1800. So if our mandate is suggesting that we need to build 2,500, I'm not, I'm just having a really hard time understanding how we're taking an area of 1800 and then adding an additional 2,500. And this goes all the way out, you know, up Adams Street. If you start on that, it goes up Adams Street and Milton Hill and Forbes and 
all the Maggie, way down. Can I, can I just do a correction based on what I heard on that seminar? It's not adding to it. You, you, it's within that district. So you don't, you're not adding on, remember when I said earlier, they say you're not counting what you already have. So you, it's that land area would have to take 2,500. So it would have to take another um, 700, 700 units. Yeah. So we're not adding 2,500 units? No. So our no, we have to zone to have capacity to, to meet that. And the current zoning has capacity to meet that, that existing number that you, you said, Maggie. OK, so then I think we need clarity on that. And thanks for pointing that out because I wasn't, that's not what I understood or have heard kind of Tim explain and yeah. what, you know, was reported in the paper. It said it was 2,500 units. That, so, if you, if you, if yeah. the way it's calculated, that was really clear in that webinar, Maggie, if you can, like that part of the webinar is not that long. The whole thing is probably an hour. So, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. So it's, it, that I felt like they made a very clear answer on that towards the mm -hmm. end of that webinar. And MHP, um, both both uh, the DHCD and the MHP webinars are available uh, at those links on the town of Milton's sort of landing page. Um, MHP has several webinars, all, all that, that delve into this specifically. And, and also something uh, important to note um, is that um, 50% of the, the zoning district has to be within these um, parameters. The other 50% can be um, in other places throughout town as, as Tim sort of demonstrated um, in his uh, October 13th presentation. Um, so there, there is a lot, of, a lot of unknowns about what it will look like. It's not all going to be compressed along here necessarily. Um, and that's exactly why we've applied for so much um, grant funding to get these really robust consultant supports um, to help us do this. We, we've, we've applied for the MHP funding for up to 25,000 and expect to get that because we are a rapid transit community. That's how the law defines us. Uh, even regardless of your views on the trolley, uh, that, is, that is how we are defined. We can't change that. Um, as well as $50,000 from um, the community one-stop program for these consultant services. So. We, we have tried to get as much money as possible to do really detailed impact analyses uh, as, as Sean was requesting, as well as some, some uh, higher level mapping of, of where and what the uh, density at, at a full build out would look like. I also so, I would, to... so it would be helpful to just get a confirmation because yeah. even at 700 units, that is still you know about half of what the existing unit count is in that area. So if it's about 1800 units in that area, you know, adding another 700 is still really detrimental. You know, yeah, I mean, it's just, significant, watching, certainly. just watching through going through and watching the 40B play out, you know, having 20 units on in an area is impactful and in 16 units and then on Canton Ave it's 100 units. So just thinking about what 700 units would be is really like kind of a little bit mind blowing. Um, and it's hard to visualize. That's precisely why we're looking for really robust consultant support. And that's why your, your feedback on what that scope of work um, on the fiscal analysis on some build out um, visualization and, and robust community engagement is, is really good feedback for what we can um, Put into our, our sort of uh, scope of work for that. So I really appreciate that, Maggie. Yeah, Thank I you. just make one more yeah. point on that, Maggie, yeah. on that piece of it that in response to Josh there, like what Sean mentioned earlier is that the number of units and, and all being new units. This is where the build out analysis is really critical because that informs the fiscal build out too. So it's not all new units. I think everybody has to start yeah. to understand that. Sorry. And it's not all at once, um, right? This is not a, a mandate to build. Um, this this puts the zoning in place and will likely have uh, decades long impacts of, of when when people decide to either sell their property for, for a, a lot more than it's currently worth because worth, it's gonna have a more robust uh, land use or, or what have you. So this is not just throwing in 700 new units um, come January 2nd, 2023. Um, but, but I do think that if, to Sean's point, if the zoning allows for it, people will come 
and take advantage and people will be selling out. Um, and I do think it'll happen much more quickly. Um, and then lastly, like at one point, Tim mentioned that he's taking part in weekly phone meetings with other towns. Um, and so I don't know if that is actually going on. And um, so I kind of wanted to know what what's been what's been said, whether what other towns are doing. And I'm just wondering if any of us um, like could I join in one of these um, phone conversations. Yeah, um, I can confirm that the, the conversations have been ongoing, as well as uh, a variety of other ones through our um, MEPC regional meetings. Uh, we, we are part of the um, ICC and the TRIC sort of MEPC communities, and those have been providing a lot of um, sort of cross-town collaboration. Um, every every town planning uh, sort of uh, staffer that Tim has talked to in, intends to do their utmost to comply with the law that's uh, our job is is to try and and follow the law um so so there's um been discussion amongst uh, our peers as to where we can maximize resources available to make sure that compliance looks as as comfortable as possible as feasible as possible um but there's been been no discussion um amongst the planning staff um, in the conversations that Tim has had uh, or that I've had in our in our regional meetings um, as to non-compliance. Um, Tim, Tim uh, will can talk further about uh, bringing you on one of those calls though. Um, it's it's mostly planning professionals um, in the staff capacity, but I'm, I'm sure you'd be more than welcome. Yeah. Is there any plan for town, you know, other planning boards to talk to other planning boards or you know, should I just go on to like no. rock, go, give rock board a call? Cause I know, you know, they're, they are, um, they're appealing, residents are appealing this. Should I just call them up and? Residents can always talk to other residents. Um, we, we stick pretty much to discussing among staff on this work. Um, and, and that is all been, uh, with an eye towards compliance and making sure we do that appropriately and um, legally. Great. Well, this was all good discussion and, and sounds like a few things that we need clarified, but I, I think these, I think we're really all going through a process of, of, um, of developing our questions because there's a lot of unknown right now to this. And so hopefully we can continue to, um, to uh, ask good questions and, and Tim can get the answers for us and a consultant. Yeah, but also hopefully the elected officials, if um, any other members had had more discussion on that, um, Tim, Tim was really interested in getting a pretty robust sort of uh, agenda uh, set of items for, for that discussion. So if any other members besides Maggie had thoughts. Um, yeah. Tim and and just that. confirmation that it's 700, because I'm pretty sure Tim told us at one point that like our existing units didn't count. So it's a relief that it's only 700, but 700 is still significant but it would really be before we move forward in any direction we should know what we're asking what is it 25 percent additional units yes or correct yeah. the, the, those mhp and dhd webinars are an excellent resource again yeah great Thank meredith you. Uh, could i could i just come back to the question that i i don't think it was a question i think it was a st i know it was a statement um, in regard to the responsibility of the town administrator, the select board and the Warren committee um, with their role for the financial um, controls and responsibility of the town, how is it that we take it from this discussion here and, and my request um, as a planning board member that those three um, well, in one case, an individual, in, in the other cases, the Warren Committee and the Select Board um, uh, groups, how do we get a message to them? Does that go from you as our chair uh, to those groups, or do you go through Tim? But I guess I, I, I want to make sure that what I'm asking <laughs> is, um, is recognized in, in some action takes place. Um, I, I, I happen to think that 
the you know the planning board could very well you know uh, participate in uh, the planning exercises, but the financial uh, implications of this is probably not what our uh, our role typically would be within the town. The financial implication implications are um, really the responsibility of those other uh, the two groups and 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 our new town administrator. I completely agree, um, and I'll reach out to Arthur because I do feel. You know, from the beginning, I've said that this is bigger than just the planning board. This is, in a, you know, this is all of our our committees, our 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 select board, our town administrator, our warrant committee. Um, this is something that I don't think should just be coming from from us. But but the, as the planning department, I think um, the select board has asked him to be the point person. So I will um, I will speak to Tim about this and how the select board how they pick up. And, and work with the uh, warrant committee on really identifying what the impact of this, we can design it, we can zone it, but it but we have to know the impact um, to, to be able to fairly present anything to the town. I have one other, I have one other thought if I may, and this is really kind of yeah. more some homework for Josh and Tim, I think. One of the things I was thinking about is I, I know that um, there's, um, an interest in not restricting the size of the units that generally can be in multifamily. However, the size of a development will definitely be based on how, how big the units are, right? Like if you had a development that was 15 units an acre of one bedrooms versus two and three and four bedrooms, you know, the, the building size could be double, you know? And so Josh, I don't know if you guys can take a look at if there's like a mix requirement that can go in there so that we can, you know, um, Milton has lots of homes already that are, you know, two, three, and four bedroom. What we mm -hmm. don't have a lot of are smaller units, right? So um, where we, we've been interested in our housing production plan and our master plan in having a diversity of housing stock, you know, this could provide diversity, but I'm also wondering if we can't restrict, if, if there's a pro prohibition in terms of unit size, unit mix, et cetera. So if that's something uh, you can think of. Cheryl, there's not, a, there's not a hard number on it, but part of the regulations um, uh, involved in not having it be uh, like age restricted, not having it be just um, sort of senior housing is also a component that the zoning has to be um, sort of uh, suitable for families with children, um, which does translate to into allowing um, Two or three or, or four bedroom units. Um, so, so there there will have to be a component of it that allows for that mix. But um, so far, we haven't seen anything as to do the sort of if there's a specific quota or percentage mm -hmm. um, on that front. But it's not like in the forty B in the forty B regs, there's there's a requirement for a number of three beds. I think. So anyway, if you could just look into it, I, I, just something that I think will help us in the build out analysis to understand the size of buildings, because yeah. it's just not, it's not just the number of, of units, it's the size of units and what that means too for how many people, how many cars, how, how much impact. Yeah, beyond suitable for families, there's nothing in the regulation uh, that, that goes beyond that specifying in the, the unit sort of um, size, um, that, that'll be up to our discretion um, as, as a town. But could certainly be part of the consultant review. That would be great. Put that and, on the list. And, and Meredith, I just wanted to um, sort of follow up on the financial part of it. I do know, it, well, it's my understanding that one of the jobs of um, the goal of our town administrator is to create a balanced budget every year. Um, but it's also to create a five-year plan. So I do kind of feel like a town administrator needs to be brought into this conversation sooner rather than later because they are starting um, their budgets. Um, and so it'd be nice to know is maybe if, um, if the town administrator was invited to one of our meetings and um, so we can, mm -hmm. we can hear from us um, the importance of um, getting a, a plan and a budget together sooner rather than later. 
Yeah. Maggie, uh, just to say, Nick Nick has been fully uh, kept abreast of, of all the work we've been doing in the planning department. Uh, he and Tim meet uh, multiple times a week, and, and this is often on their agendas. So um, he's certainly aware, and, and I'm sure would be happy to uh, be a guest at one of our upcoming meetings to talk about it further. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Meredith, anything uh, else? My yes. last, my, my yes, last comment. I would really appreciate if if Nick could attend one of our meetings. Um, I, I I think if he if he is um, as engaged as Josh Josh uh, said he is, it'd yeah. be really uh, it, it'd be helpful for us to understand um, what his thoughts are now and and as the town administrator, what actions he's taking to um, yeah. to explore this. That's great. I think that's a great suggestion. So. We can definitely put that on the agenda to invite him. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so next, um, oh, is Meredith, I just want to confirm that there are no other um, agenda items that folks want to talk about with elected officials. Um, Tim was really interested in having a, a that. Yes, um, some, just one last thing. Maggie mentioned some things. Uh, I'm curious, um, are they being debriefed by DHCD on the design guidelines? And um, are they anticipating any other um, role as those as the design guidelines move forward and implementation moves forward? So um, that would be something I'm interested in hearing. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Perfect. And please feel free to email um, Tim or Josh if you have any other questions that you think of um, that, that we would ask our state elected uh, delegation. So those were all good, good thoughts and questions. Um, so next, um, moving on, we have the discussion of the East Milton zoning RFP. Um, and this was basically taking what we have in Josh, I don't know if you want to introduce this a little bit more, but this is so in the bidding process, we can be a little bit more selective and not have to go by simply cost. So, yeah, and that, that's precisely it, Meredith. Um, what uh, Tim and I were interested in uh, getting the, the board's feedback on um, was uh, a, a set of sort of uh, broader um, evaluation criteria for um, proposals that we receive. Um, so, because we have that, that remit to be able to look beyond just uh, the lowest cost. Um, we provided a series of, of RFPs um, in your meeting materials that had um, there uh, some, some really good examples of comparative sort of uh, criteria for, for analysis. I'm just gonna quickly share my screen um, because I think, um, the, the town of Littleton has a really uh, robust and detailed um, criteria uh, that they use, including a sort of breakdown on uh, if uh, a, a proposal is highly advantageous, just advantageous or not advantageous to really be clear on how they are um, reviewing the proposals that they receive. Uh, a lot of these criteria revolve around the uh, sort of demonstrable skill of uh, the consultants. So the professional qualifications of project personnel, as well as the sort of staff for planning, um, past experience, if they've had three or more or five or more uh, plans of a sort of similar concept that they can point to. Um, Littleton and, and other towns specifically sort of value uh, familiarity with um, the actual uh, town. So if we wanted to uh, prioritize um, those who we've worked with in the past um, and are very familiar with Milton, um, that is within the, 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 the sort of bounds of this, um, these sort of project skill as if, as if we are sort of uh, interviewing job candidates is, is really the sort of thought that this, this goes into not just looking at the, the lowest cost, but um, their, their ability to engage the public as, as we sort of uh, decided with uh, the evening, well, uh, visioning process. Um, and so I just wanted to open the floor to your thoughts on, on some key um, 
evaluation criteria that we could include in our RFP as we send it out um, to, to really make sure we're getting the best possible plans back. If the board wants to speak, I, I did really like Littleton. I know Josh, um, when I stopped in the office, you had mentioned that, you know, this being possibly a good fit and it's very specific um, and gives some real, I think the criteria is very clear you know, that there would not be any question that would ever hold up legally. Um, it's, it's got a lot of teeth to it. I, um, I really liked the way it ranked um, the um, comparative evaluation criteria, minimum qualifications it li laid out, depth of experience, um, strength and credibility of client references, um, you know, certainly um, <laughs> approach to all projects. And I really liked, um, the ability to meet the project, project schedule, you know, to be able to have the staff um, necessary and that there was a real component of um, public outreach and that there was experience in public outreach. Cause I think particularly with East Milton, um, you know, I, th I think it's gonna be really important to listen in here um, from, the, from the all residents, but, but from the neighbors who would be affected by this. So I did like their, their uh, detailed um, standards or what they were looking for. And familiar, familiarity with the, with the town. Milton is really unique. Um, and I think, um, I think the only thing that I would change really that they put in there is they have a selection committee and I would just change that language to the planning board will review all proposals or the, with planning staff would be the only item I would mention. Any other members from the board? Uh, Sean had his hand up as well as Sean? Cheryl. And Cheryl yeah. does too, yes. Uh, okay, I, I definitely agree with um, how they have theirs prepared. And um, two, two comments uh, that I would like to um, reiterate, one that you made and one that Josh made. I think familiarity with the town is huge. Uh, we we need we need someone who you know who this is this is not brand new to um, you know uh, so I think the familiarity of the town is huge and with regard to uh, price um, uh, it's it's far less important in my opinion than anything else um, and it doesn't mean that it's not important but I don't think we should make this decision based on price I you know I think all of us when we you know, uh, choosing someone, um, you know, that you're choosing as a professional, um, we're not choosing them based on price. And in this particular case, I, I, I hope that everyone would agree that, you know, price is not gonna be the driver of the decision making. Thank you, Sean. And this would allow us to do that by that. Yeah. And Cheryl, you had your hand up? It did, yes. Um, one thing um, I think you have to be clear what you mean by familiarity with the town, because does that mean you've worked in the town? Because that means like two people can apply or two firms can apply. So I think it's important to think about familiarity in a broader context, like experience in similar towns, um, I think is also something that could be weighted well because I actually think we can learn too from other communities. We're, I know we all like to think of each of our own towns as being very unique, but we do have some similar characteristics mm -hmm. to other towns. And so um, that's what a good consultant with experience can bring is experience in other communities. And so that's my pitch on that. And then uh, on the- can I, uh, could, I, could I respond? Because I agree with you. I, okay. I probably didn't say it as well as I should have. I, I would hope that it's not someone, there's, there's someone who doesn't necessarily have familiarity with Milton, but probably with many towns like Milton. And, and I, I think I needed to say what I said in a different way. Um, we don't need somebody who has familiarity with South Boston or East Boston, or, you know, uh, I, I, I hope it's someone that has, um, you know, experience with a town like ours, so. So then I'm in complete agreement then with that. Or yeah. we're in agreement, it sounds like, on that point. Um, 
you know, uh, as a consultant who responds to RFPs, these words are important, you know, and how you describe them. Because if somebody read that, I might have read that and said, I'm not going to submit on this because I don't have a chance. You know, so you want to be really thoughtful about how, the words that you choose. Um, I really like in Harvard um, the idea of a project approach. You know, I've seen this as a really good opportunity in other RFPs. Um, I serve on the board of a nonprofit also that has solicited proposals from other architects. So I see what what the what others do with this. And anyway, um, you can learn something here. Like we've outlined what we think is the best process in the RFP, but in the project approach, you actually give the consultants an opportunity to give you some other ideas that you may not have thought of. And so I think that's a good thing to include. And then um, I do uh, agree that um, it's, it's nice to have clear criteria, but it also, there should be some minimum qualifications so that you have something against uh, which you're measuring these things. And so, um, you don't want to, uh, so I thought that Littleton has some things there, not all of them are relevant to what we're looking to do, but I think, you know, the next step could be that Josh and Tim put together um, a, a draft of these things, a revised draft of the RFP with these things included for us to review, and they can think about what they, uh, some of the minimum qualifications, uh, because then they can do a first review and um, and sort of pre or uh, whittle it down if there's a lot. Of, hopefully there'll be a lot of interest, and then you know they can whittle it down to the ones that um, that we can give consideration further consideration to. Those are my comments. Great. And Maggie, you had your hand up as well. Um, yeah, just a couple things. So um, you know I don't want to restate everything you said. You guys all said Littleton is um, the most comprehensive, so I agree with that. I just want to, you know, to Cheryl's point, words matter. So the only thing that stood out to me um, in the Littleton, just be careful. You know, I don't like the word um, urban design. Um, I think, you know, we are a town. We want to continue being a town. So just maybe don't reference, don't put the word urban in there because we don't really want to be a city. Also, um, being a little bit more um, careful with the word uh, meetings with the town. I think it should be with the planning board um, or and or planning staff. Um, and that's everything else I agree with you on. The only other comment I have is actually on the RFP itself. So I was reviewing um, that again. And I just saw a couple things. Number one, that um, as I pointed out before, I think there should be consistency in how the planning department um, is refer is referenced as. So it's a couple different ways in the RFP. One, it says the planning department. And the next one, it says the Department of Planning and Community Development. So just be consistent on that. It's in task. Um, Three, And also, I think um, just a few little edits in task three, you used the um, term user-friendly format twice. I mean, that's a little repetitive. Um, and the planning board has been omitted from task three in letter D. It said working with the planning department and, and master plan implementation committee, it doesn't say anything about the planning board. So that has to be um, brought in. And in task 3C, it, it, um, it seemed like the, the sentence was um, deleted, but part of the sentence remained. It just says department staff, period. So I think that needs um, to um, get edited. So before Thanks, Maggie. Ahead. Those will go in, into the edits for sure. Um, okay. Appreciate that. Close review. Great. Yeah, fresh eyes on it after looking back. Um, so Josh, can you work up a draft of a new revised and sort of circulate that and see if that captures? Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll get that to you guys. Um, 
early in the week. Uh, obviously, town hall is closed tomorrow for the for Veterans Day, so I can't get it to you ASAP. Yeah. But um, uh, we can get it to you um, early in the week. That's great. Terrific. And any other comments? If people have, please, you know, feel free to reach out to Josh or Tim on that. Um, okay. Um, so the next um, is the update on the 40B land area minimum calculation. Josh, if you want to update folks. Yes, uh, so we uh, received a uh, scope of work from VSC group um, to assist us with some mapping services to calculate our uh, general land area minimum um, so that we can get a little bit of a better sense on our eligibility for safe harbor um, if we have um, eligible housing that occupies uh, more than one and a half percent of the total land area in town. Um, so they, they provided us a scope of services that includes um, identifying the parcels that contain um, uh, SHI sort of sites in the town. Uh, they'll be working with, with us as well as with our, our GIS uh, with uh, Alan Bishop um, and do the calculations of total area and um, SHI eligible area. Um, the calculations can be a little convoluted with how much uh, you know, town is, is is town owned versus sort of state land. So, so it's, it's a pretty complicated map that they'll be doing. But um, BSE has uh, proposed a this project um, that is estimated to cost um, $9,800 uh, $9, um, for their sort of calculations and estimates. Um, I believe that that scope of work was was distributed earlier, but that that's the the, the general premise of um, the proposal we've received from them. That sounds great. I think it is something that we had voted on previously to approve um, doing this land count um, if it did fall under the ten thousand dollar amount. So Cheryl, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering, Josh, why it's an estimate and not a fixed fee, and if it, what would drive it over 9,800, and where would those dollars come from? Sorry, Meredith, um, Cheryl. Um, I they don't say what would be um, uh, additional. Um, the uh, Proposal though is on uh, like an hourly basis for their fee schedule, um, but um, they um, want to give themselves that leeway to provide us, um, then will give us notice um, if it becomes necessary to exceed uh, the hours. Um, so can they make that? Uh, can they make that a cap? Ninety eight hundred dollar cap at least, um, and then. If they, like as you said, if they're going to exceed that cap, they come back uh, for approval. Because yeah. at least that way, we're not agreeing to an open-ended contract. No, uh, this this is just the sort of standard um, language to make sure that there is that that leeway if if something happens that causes them to need to increase their hours. But the, the current um, proposal includes that that they will be. Um, giving us ample uh, leeway um, if they intend to go outside of that budget. But I, I can certainly follow up with him and see if um, that can be set as a cap rather than uh, what they've currently proposed as a estimate that they'll intend to stick to and, and inform us if that um, is not possible. That would be great. If you could follow up and let the, let the board know that that is fixed, because that is what we had approved was not to exceed. Yeah, but the expectation it wouldn't exceed. Any other questions on that? No? Okay, and I'll follow up with Tim specifically just on that question too, just to, to make sure we get the answers. Okay, um, so is there any, um, anything else that, um, any future agenda items that people would like to see or um, otherwise, you know, you can let me know, but um, 
Otherwise we can call for a motion to adjourn. Yes, Cheryl. I just have a question on the Winter Valley. Um, Josh said the application came in, so I understand they're reviewing it. So is the intent that that hearing is gonna be, um, well, it hasn't been advertised yet, so it wouldn't be right. our next meeting, right? Uh, no, no. Um, it's going through the Conservation Commission now. Um, we'll be with them on the 15th. Um, we've done the technical site plan review and sent that back with our comments for them to submit a, a an updated final plan. And when, when they have that, um, it'll, it'll be put on the agenda. Um, I anticipate it probably being the second meeting in December on the, on the 15th, um, if it comes before the end of the year. Okay, and um, there are only a handful of direct abutters to that particular site, but one of those properties did sell recently. Yes, so we're a new we're owner, a new resident there. I just wanted to make sure that you um, somehow that, you know, rather than just getting a notice in the mail that they're kind of brought up to speed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we are well aware of that. Um, Ned uh, Corcoran, who's who's the uh, attorney with with uh, Winter Valley, um, is also aware of that. So their their notices to abutters went to the correct folks, and um, it, it hadn't yet been updated on the uh, assessor's map, uh, which is why um, it, current plans that we received uh, still had um, EMG Revocable Trust as as the current tenant. But um, what we've talked to our assessor's office, and, and they they're updating that as well. So. Um, we, we've said that to the correct butter and ensured that that uh, is going to the right uh, folks. And Josh, I do, have, I do yeah, have a phone number and email address um, that is a neighbor. So I did stop in and introduce myself. So if you need that, let me know. Um, I, we probably don't need it, but um, the more, more info, the better. So I'm happy to have you send that to Tim. Um, and Josh, when is the neighborhood meeting? There is a meeting with the neighbors, correct? That's um, if there is, um, I believe that's being organized and facilitated by Winter Valley. We've not yet heard a date beyond the date for the Conservation Commission on the 15th. Okay. And then the, the uh, intended sidewalk will, will almost certainly be on the 19th. Okay. So and I'll check with Tim if our, our next meeting would be a public, if they present um, if it would be considered one of our public hearings. Because I believe we will need two public hearings um, that we should have at least two. Yeah, um, and, if, if there if there are updated plans are ready by our next meeting, absolutely. Um, but, but we'll know more once we get an updated plan. Great. Well, I just, if you could kind of map out a schedule, it'd be helpful with the holidays coming up and people being mm -hmm. away. Um, because I, um, I would like to, um, make sure that we can plan around things if we can, right. And if we need a special meeting that we can, um, have time to schedule that because I'm mindful that it takes, you know, two consecutive weeks of advertising before the opening of the hearing. And so we, I know everybody's um, aware of this, but it's just helpful to sort of plan ahead, think ahead. Yeah, absolutely, Cheryl. Yeah, well, Ned's been in the office regularly, so so we're we're working closely with with the Winter Valley team to to make sure everything's above board and on track. Great. Okay. Well, um, so with nothing else, um, if did anyone else have anything, um, then we I would entertain a motion uh, to adjourn the evening. So moved. Second. Okay. That's great. Roll call. All in favor? Um, Cheryl? Yes. Sean? Yes. Maggie? Yes. And myself? Yes. Thank you all. Have a great Thank night. You. Thank you guys. All right. Have, Have a great, great night. night. Yeah. Good night. Bye -bye.